think, Kirk, that the devil thinks that disability is his last frontier. This is this is his, he's going to make a stand against the goodness of God. He's going to use disability as ammunition against the goodness of God, spitefully saying, look, at how could God call himself good if he allows this child to be born with that birth defect? Mm -hmm. You can't call yourself good, God. So that's what we want to change. Johnny, it's so great to be with you. Thanks for coming on Takeaways. Oh, absolutely, Kirk, and thanks for having me on, sir. You're one of my favorite people in the world, and I'm so grateful for the story that God has written and demonstrated his faithfulness in your life, and, and to see how you're serving him is such an example to the rest of us. Uh, Johnny, talk to those who, who aren't familiar with your story about uh, what life was like before your accident. Uh, what, what did you oh. like to do, and what was your relationship with God like? Oh, Kirk, we would have gone camping, hunting, swimming, playing tennis, horseback riding, you name it. I was quite the athlete. And as such, I guess I was the least likely candidate to uh, become a quadriplegic. But as far as my relationship with the Lord goes, Jesus was kind of tucked away in my back hip pocket. And I pulled him out on uh, Sundays and holidays and, and Easter and Christmas. But um when I was a senior in high school, I was frustrated with, uh, with my shallow life in Christ. And to be honest, Kirk, I had a boyfriend back then, and we were doing some stuff on Friday nights that was pretty embarrassing. Um, it laded me with guilt. Sunday mornings, I'd confess my sins. Oh, God, I'll never do that again. But then the following Friday night in the backseat of my boyfriend's car, there we'd be uh, fooling around again. And, oh, I just hated the sin. I hated the guilt, and I said, finally, Jesus, I have entrapped myself in sin. I've become a slave to it. W would you do something in my life to jerk it right side up? Because I don't want to be a hypocrite, and I don't want to go off to college making a, a sham of your good name. And Kirk, I prayed a prayer in April of 1967 saying, God, do anything, anything. I just want to honor you from here on out, and you need to help me get free of sin. And then I graduated a couple of months later, and two weeks after that, went for a swim in the Chesapeake Bay with my sister, dove into shallow water. My head hit a sandy bottom and snapped my head back and crunched my vertebrae, snapped my spinal cord, and I was lying face down in the water paralyzed. And the next thing I knew, um, my sister was pulling me up out of the water. I was gasping, sputtering, near drowning, and doctors told me, you've broken your neck, you're never going to walk again, or, or, or have use of your hands. My, my hands don't work. I, I wear arm splints to support them, but that was 55 years ago. And I have to confess, Kirk, that at first I was quite angry at God that he took my prayer so seriously. Like, hello? I mean, aren't you being a little severe? Um, I asked for a closer walk with you, and this is your answer? I, I, I thought God was being awfully unfair. And, uh, but over time, Christians were praying, Christians were loving me, and uh, slowly but surely, I came up out of depression. And I began to ask people, why should I trust God if he allowed yeah. this to happen? So it was a good question to start me off on this journey. Wow. I have known you for years now, and my children have gotten to know you a little bit, interning at your disability ministry, Johnny and Friends. Um, and you're one of the most inspirational people that I know, and I've heard you say things like God permits things that he hates in order to accomplish what he loves. I've heard you say things that I would rather be in this wheelchair knowing Jesus than to be on my feet without him. Uh, these are things that are so encouraging and inspiring to us, but they're almost confusing because we don't understand how you could say those things. And what does make sense is what you just mentioned. Um, why would God let something like this happen? Um, Johnny, did you ever feel just downright angry and betrayed by God? I felt angry. I felt almost betrayed, but to be quite honest, Kirk, I was, I was fearful of turning my back on him because I had nowhere else to go. I was paralyzed. I was sitting in the corner feeling sorry for myself. I needed hope. And I knew that if I was to find hope, it would have to be in God and God alone. And I'll never forget, uh, real quickly, I, I asked a friend of mine, how can any of this be God's will? Come on. I mean, I thought God's will was only for good stuff. 
And he said, now, wait a minute, Johnny, look at what God allowed in the life of his own son, Jesus. He allowed murder, injustice, torture. I mean, real torture and treason. How can any of that be good in our eyes or even his? But again, you said it. God permits what he hates to accomplish something that he loves. And yes, he hated the torture, the murder, the, the treason, the injustice that led up to the crucifixion. But the world's worst murder became the world's only salvation. And my friend said, Johnny, the same is true in your life or any of our lives. God doesn't like spinal cord injury. He hates suffering. Oh, my goodness, when, when he walked on earth, he spent most of his time trying to relieve it. So he despises the pain and the anguish, but he will allow it to produce something good in your life. And I said, well, what could, could that possibly be? And he said, how about Christ in you? I mean, the God of the universe dwelling in you, changing you, turning you from a headstrong, stubborn, hypocritical, self-centered teenager <laughs> into a young woman who by his grace might appreciate something of perseverance, patience, endurance, self-control, um, bravery, courage. And over time, I began to value those virtues in mm. my life. And I think that's when I began to find my smile. And you do have one of the most joyful smiles of anyone that I know. <laughs> and <laughs> jo Johnny, you were enrolled in the most difficult of schools to learn these lessons of patience, of trusting in God, of walking by faith and not by sight. And, and I've read your book, I know your story uh, better than some. And how do you go from that place to finding and discovering the peace and the joy that animates your smile? Well, Kirk, I'm gonna tell you a secret that I hope, um, I hope all of our viewers will employ tomorrow morning when they wake up. I don't like being paralyzed. Quadriplegia is hard. I deal with chronic pain, that's even harder. It makes my quadriplegia feel like a walk in the park. And, and, and so when I wake up in the morning and my friends are still in the kitchen brewing uh, coffee and I know they're gonna come into my bedroom in a minute um, and greet me and give me a bed bath, do my toileting routines, stretch my legs, get me dressed, sit me up in a wheelchair, brush my teeth, blow my nose. Oh, and I'm lying there thinking, God, I don't have strength for this. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And I, I cannot do quadriplegia, mm. but I can do all things through you as you strengthen me. And Kirk, by 7.35 in the morning, I've, I've got joy that's already been hard fought for, but it's real, it's profound, it's deep. And it's lasting. And, and I think sometimes all of us, God has to push us up against the wall where, where we've got nowhere else to go but turn around, face that wall, and start walking through it. Do the impossible. Just do the impossible and say, I can't do this, but I can. I can do all things through you, Jesus, as you strengthen me. And what do you know? God specializes in doing impossible things, and he will give you that ability to persevere, to endure, to be patient, to move forward, to be courageous, to be brave. Mm. Oh, and there's nothing better than, than having those virtues uh, well up within your heart every morning and get your face on the day. And, and I know that you have personal, regular disciplines of reading God's word and, and allowing your mind to be saturated with the promises of God. And you don't just read them, you sing them. Every time I, I'm, I come uh, into Johnny and Friends ministry building, I, I, I hear this angelic voice somewhere in the halls or in the chapel, and it's Johnny singing another hymn. A mighty fortress oh, is our God. That's right. Or, or, and, and, and the doxology, and these are the things that yeah. I know have reminded you of the, of the faithfulness and promises of God, and you've appropriated them in ways that many people have never had to, but you make it real for us, too. Yeah, well, Psalm 119, verse 50 says, this is my comfort in suffering. Okay, like what? What is it? What is your comfort in suffering? What Your promises renew my life. And so, Kirk, you're absolutely right. I memorize Bible promises left, right, and center, and I sing them. 
I, I sing my way through suffering. I sing because I have to sing. I mean, my, my circumstances are so awful. <laughs> There's no better word for it. They're just, they're just, they're just awful. They're, I mean, I could cry talking about it. They are so hard and harsh. I've got to anchor myself, like it says in Hebrews. We got to, we got to make Christ our anchor, firm and secure. I've, I've hooked the corner of that anchor over the mercy seat, and I am not letting go. Jesus, don't let me go. I'm thinking of Psalm 63. Um, my spirit clings to you, but it is your right hand that upholds me. I mean, I cling to Him, and it's a little weak half-hearted grip, but oh, I've got the right arm of God's strong salvation gripping me. Mm. He's not going to let go as long as I continue to yield myself to him. And that's what I do every morning. Don't be thinking, and I hope none of your viewers think this is easy. Man, it's not easy. It's so darn hard. But I'm like Peter. Where else do I turn? Lord, you have the words of life. So I'm going to eat those words of life. I'm going to memorize those uh, words of life, those uh, Bible promises, and make them my own. And I would encourage our viewers to do the same if they're struggling. Johnny, I want everyone to know about this amazing organization that you started called Johnny and Friends. Uh, would you share a little bit about what it is and why you started the Johnny and Friends Disability Ministry? Kirk, what, four, five, six years after my diving accident, and I'd come up out of depression and my church was so supportive and I was being blessed so much. I was growing, I was changing, I was finding joy in my hardships, uh, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. I, I, I was experiencing so many benefits from the Lord. It's like, I, ca I can't keep these to myself. I just, I just can't keep this to myself. I gotta pass the good news on to other people with disabilities. I, I found so much hope, so much joy. Oh my goodness, there's so many other people in the country and around the world who are suffering far more than I am. And I, I wanna give them the same good news that, that transformed my life. And, and so that's pretty much why I started Johnny and Friends. I'm just one lady. I can't do it by myself. So I got a lot of friends uh, here in the States and around the world who carry out our programs to give the good news of Jesus to, to millions of people with disabilities who, as I said, are in uh, circumstances far more challenging than mine ever will be. So it, it, it all got started because I wanted to pass on the blessing. And, and let me tell you, it is the real deal, everyone. Uh, the Johnny and Friends um, International Disability Center is right down the road from where my family lives and my children have interned there at Johnny and Friends. And what a blessing that is. Uh, they have learned so much from you personally and from all the staff there and the volunteers. And you're helping people with wheelchairs and delivering the gospel and Johnny is writing books and her paintings are inspiring people all over the world. Uh, Johnny, one of the questions that, that, that I think about is, what is living with a disability like in a developing nation, in a third world country, in places where you don't have the Mayo Clinic, you don't have Cedar sinai Hospital or Johns Hopkins? Well, I remember in 1989, I was in the Philippines and it was during the monsoon season. I was there speaking at a pastor's conference and I was waiting outside the uh, stadium with an umbrella over me. And I looked across the street and there was a, a woman who dragged herself through the muddy road. She was dragging her paralyzed legs behind her. And she came up to the back door of a restaurant and tucked her legs up underneath of her and sat there quietly by the door until someone opened and handed her a, a bag of scraps. And I asked the, my pastor friend, I asked about her and, and he said, well, I know that woman. She is a respectable woman, a good woman. And things should not be like this in our nation. They should not be like this in anywhere else in the world. You know, dragging your legs behind you through a dirty, muddy street, um, trying to avoid traffic, uh, begging for food. I, and I saw that, Kurt. And on my way home on the airplane, I said, Lord Jesus, if you could please use my life to make a difference in that woman's life, I'd give anything. I'll do anything. It was my first experience with someone who was that disabled and who was that impoverished. And uh, so right away I came home and I said, team, we've got we've to make a difference in the lives of people like I saw in the Philippines because there are millions of them just like that around the world. And of course, having traveled to 60 countries, I've seen many sites like that replicated time and time again. 
uh, where people with disabilities um, live like homeless people. They live under uh, bridges uh, alongside rivers. They, they do the best they can. They're relegated to back bedrooms, often in Southeast Asia. Their parents are ashamed of them. There's much social stigma connected to disability. So when, when we take wheelchairs around the world and we've delivered hundreds of thousands of wheelchairs and Bibles, it's not only about giving a wheelchair, it's about changing the culture of disability and helping people see that a disability is not a curse from the, from the local shaman or it's not a curse from the witch doctor or the animus spirits, but we are all image bearers of our great creator God. In one way or another, we reflect, we're image bearers of, of the Lord Jesus. And, and, and that's what we wanna do through every wheelchair that we deliver to every retreat that we have for families struggling with disability, either here in the United States or around the world in developing nations, we want to change people's perspective on disability. Mm. That uh, Because I, I think, Kirk, that the devil thinks that disability is his last frontier. This is this is his, he's going to make a stand against the goodness of God. He's going to use disability as ammunition against the goodness of God spitefully saying, look, at how can God call himself good if he allows this child to be born with that birth defect? Huh. You can't call yourself good, God. So that's what we want to change, that perspective. And that's the, the point behind all the program services that we have to not only give physical support, but spiritual hope in, in the Bible and in the good news of Jesus. Amazing. Wonderful. Johnny, can you share with us the, uh, uh, maybe one story that you might remember of how a wheelchair changes somebody's life? Maybe you can think of somebody in the Philippines or Africa or in, in Asia or, or even here in the United States. What, what does it mean to someone to finally be able to be mobile? Well, I remember when I was in Africa, um, we were doing a wheelchair distribution and a family came in carrying something in a blanket. I didn't know what it was, but um, they had all four corners of the blanket and they carried this young teenager in. He was severely disabled. His limbs were contorted and twisted. He had never had any physical therapy, so he was quite stiff. And, uh, and there he spent all his days lying in that burlap sack, being carried from place to place in a blanket. And our Wheels for the World team worked seven hours to construct for him a wheelchair that would be adequate, that would recline, that had chest supports and a shoulder harness, that had side supports, that had elevating leg lifts. I mean, it, it was a zippity doo dah perfect wheelchair for this young boy. And I'll never forget when they sat him in it, he was able to reach the wheel rim, uh, the wheels, wheelchair rims with his hands. And for the first time in his life, he was able to move himself just inches. And he broke out in laughter. He was so excited. And then when he realized he could do, we couldn't stop him. He was pushing <laughs> that wheelchair as hard as he could all over the distribution site, just laughing. And his mother and father were weeping tears of gratitude. But the best part is uh, we gathered that family together. And a local pastor was able to share in their language uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They opened their hearts to the Lord for the very first time. Um, the pastor said something to us afterward. He said, you know, this is a family my church would not normally care about. But I see you people and the love you have for them. And I know now God has love for them. And I'm going to make them a part of our church. Oh, that wow. just made me just, I was so excited because not only did this family come to Christ, but that whole congregation was transformed as they began to see that God's power always shows up in weakness. He delights in, in showcasing his love to the vulnerable, the poor, the unlikely, the unlovely. Um, these are the ones that he wants gathered into our congregations because then his power can explode through them. And I, I saw it that day in Africa. That was quite something there in Ethiopia. Johnny, you mentioned earlier that it's important that when we meet someone with a disability that we don't define them by their disability. Where should we find our value? What, what determines our true worth? Whether we're able or disabled, whether we're experiencing discomfort or comfort, um, 
how do we stay focused on God and determine our value? Well, our value comes from the fact that we bear the image of God, for sure. And our, our value comes from knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ died the most excruciatingly painful, anguished, horrific death to secure for us a home in heaven. I mean, when I think of myself, I do not think of myself primarily as a quadriplegic or even a pain sufferer uh, or even uh, in my 70s. No, I think of myself as a blood-bought believer in, in the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and he is the one who gives me value. He is the one who has a plan for my life, a plan for your life, a plan for all of, for the lives of all of those who are watching us right now, a beautiful plan. It, 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 and sometimes it could be as humble as being a witness to our husband or our children, a witness to our neighbors, um, just being a witness to the people at our church. I mean, it, or we could be uh, my bedridden friends. They are prayer warriors. They see their value in the kingdom yeah. as being intercessors uh, for God's great kingdom all across the globe. So we all have a purpose, and God promises us in the Psalms, he will fulfill his purposes in our life. He will not abandon the work of his hands. So every day I pray from Philippians, Lord God, um, carry to completion that which you have begun in me until the very last breath. I know I'm living for a purpose. So. I just want to partner with you to find out what that is today. It's a great way to live. Johnny, thank you for that answer. I'm so glad that, that you and Ken are friends of me and Chelsea and our family. You are a gift to us and to so many people. Thanks for joining me on Takeaways today. Oh, Kirk, always good to be with you, sir. I love you so much.